Judith McLaughlin is the author of The Shamrock and the Peach. Um, she has probably the most beautiful accent of anyone I've ever met. And um, if you haven't already watched some of the other classes that she has done here at Bread Beckers with us, I highly encourage you to go on our website and check those out. Um, we did the first one at Christmas time, right? The Celtic mm -hmm. Christmas, um, where she shared a lot of um, holiday recipes from Ireland. And then she and I did our first class together in March. We did a um, St. Patrick's Day class that was so much fun, and that food was incredible. Um, and then we're doing, I don't think we've done any of these recipes, with the exception of the chicken salad. We did do the chicken salad at Christmas time. Um, but other than that, these are all new recipes. So even if you've come to uh, some of the other classes that she's done, um, these are, you're going to get to taste even more of the fabulous food that comes out of her cookbook. I honestly can say that every recipe that I have tried in this cookbook, I have absolutely loved. My family has loved. They are, they're not super, super hard recipes. They're very simple, very family friendly, very kid friendly. Um, and then it is probably the most um, beautiful cookbook in my collection of cookbooks, and it is well worth it. Um, I love the fact that there is pretty much a story that goes with every single recipe. Um, it kind of catalogs her journey from Ireland to America and how where she's from in Ireland is very similar traditionally and, and things like that and our customs and the way we eat and the way we have family time together around the table is very similar to the South. So it's definitely a fusion of Ireland and Southern um, hospitality and things like that. So this is um, a fantastic cookbook. Um, if you brought yours with you and you would like Judith to sign it, then she will happily do that at the end. We also, we carry this cookbook. So if you wanna pick up a copy of it after the class and have her um, sign it for you, I know that she will be happy to do that. So without further ado, Judith McLaughlin. Mm -hmm. Did I say it right this time? Yes, perfect. I did, okay, yes. good. Well, I've been working on that. Hello everyone, thank you so much for signing up for this class. And uh, as Ashley said, it's just wonderful to see the tradition of grandmothers and mothers and daughters and passing down that tradition of having afternoon tea. And for me, growing up in Ireland, it's very much in my, pa in my heart, ha memories of having uh, afternoon tea with my grandmother and even when she was in her 90s, and she actually had Alzheimer's towards the end, but even then she would pull out the three-tier keg stand and go to the refrigerator, and whatever she had, she would have created something beautiful, even with a piece of ham and cheese and a cocktail stick or a cherry. She would just pick from what she had and create something beautiful. And you'll see over here one of the teacups that I have that was actually my grandmother's and I've a really neat story about the, the teacup and uh, basically when I moving over from Ireland to America it was obviously a, a time where I was very homesick and I was missing my mother and my grandmother I moved over with my husband and it obviously was a great adventure when we were just newly married and but obviously when you have children you miss your 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 parents and you miss that nurturing and I had just been home to Ireland and my grandmother had passed away a few weeks later and I just had a little baby and my family didn't want me to fly home for the funeral and I, I didn't but it was obviously very sad but about six months later I did go home to Ireland and my mother had some things that she kept from me that belonged to my grandmother and she didn't actually look at the teacup but you can take a look at this teacup when I looked at the teacup I turned it over and I started to cry because the name of the tea set was called Atlanta. And my grandmother ran a bed and breakfast in the 30s and 40s in Ireland uh, by the seaside. And this was actually a really old tea set. And many ways I felt it was part of her heritage that is still with me, that passing on of the generation. And you know, sometimes we don't know, but sometimes you have those moments where you feel as if those that have passed on are with us in some way. And very much when I have tea, I always think about my grandmother. And that's why I love the tradition of that because I think there's something bonding with women getting together. And there's something about the elegance and femininity that we share when we have a cup of tea, when we eat elegant food. And it's good for the heart, it's good for the soul. And we all live such incredibly busy lives. 
that we really need to make time to have tea, make time to sit and to enjoy each other's company and to chat and to connect. And we want you to be not just participate in, in the class and listening to us, but we want you to have a time because you're with your daughters and we want you to enjoy this and to have a really fun time this morning. And I hope that you get a chance to engage and build some of those stories and memories today. And I'm gonna be telling you lots of different stories. And I know that you're all are ready to eat and want to get something, some good food. So I will keep on talking and lots of more stories, but this is just a, a, a little bit of an introduction. And I'm gonna hand it over to Ashley to introduce the next uh, couple of items. And I'm going to go over and help the girls uh, do some final prepping. So I'll hand yes, it over to you, right. Ashley, thank you. <clears throat> um, you should have gotten a handout when you came in. Um, and this is a list of um, the foods that we're going to be serving today. And then you'll notice, um, as wonderful as Judith's cookbook is, um, and she, she personally does grind her grain and things like that, um, but we've had to do some conversion for you because her cookbook does call for white flour and white sugar and brown sugar. And of course, you know that's never going to happen um, at the Breadbeckers. <laughs> so, um, but what is really interesting, um, because any of, if any of you already are customers of the Breadbeckers and you're grinding your own wheat, you've heard us say before in the past when you're using soft wheat to convert a recipe that you typically need to add more than what the recipe calls for because the soft white flour um, or the soft white wheat is such higher in moisture than regular pastry flour or white flour. Um, and But what I've noticed in converting some of Judith's recipes, especially those that were her grandparents' bread recipes and things like that, I don't have to convert. I can use the exact same amount. And she and I were talking about it yesterday, and I, I, I really believe that it's because her grandparents would have been using freshly ground flour. So, um, so there's no, so when you start playing around with some of these recipes, know that some of the, some of the quick breads and things like that, and the scones and stuff like that, um, you don't need to convert. Um, like you typically would with the soft wheat. So just play around with that. Um, but that is one thing I've noticed. So on your sheet here, we've listed um, the Breadbecker substitutions for each recipe. Um, so you'll notice the first thing that we're actually going to do is the gingerbread scones with lemon curd and fresh whipped cream. I'm actually making that for you in the class. And then I'm also going to be um, making the old Irish tea bread for you. So those are the two that I'm going to do. So if you have your cookbook with you, um, you can switch, uh, flip to page 125. That's the gingerbread scones with the clotted lemon cream. And then you'll notice um, it calls for self-rising flour. So I've given you the measurements for making your own self-rising flour. And then in place of the brown sugar, I use the sucanat. And in place of the granulated sugar, I've used um, the honey granules. So I'm gonna grab my things from back here. Now, I've already got my, um, my dry ingredients uh, mixed together here. Scones typically use, um, you cut in your butter. Now, if, if I was making a uh, small batch of this, just like a single, um, when I've done this at home, I've actually split this recipe in half. Um, there we go. Um, and in that case, I did cut the butter in just with my fingers and just kind of did it with my fingers. And that works really, really well. Um, in fact, that bowl's big enough, so I think I'm just going to do that today. And I've got my cold butter. Anytime you cut in butter into a recipe like this, um, you want the butter to be cold. So I'm just going to, these are my dry ingredients. I'm going to go ahead and add my ginger and my cinnamon and my sucanat in place of the brown sugar. I made these actually at Christmas time. Um, I try to um, make little gift baskets for some of my close friends at Christmas time. Um, and of course, you know, I wouldn't be a breadbacker daughter 
if I didn't put some type of baked goodie in my little gift baskets that I make for friends. Well, um, we had just started carrying Judith's cookbook, and she had come and done, did the class, um, the Celtic Christmas class. And so I decided um, that my gift baskets this past Christmas were going to be all about scones. Um, and so I did three different kinds of um, scones. Two of them were out of her cookbook. Um, I did the gingerbread scones, and I did, um, there's a mixed berry and white chocolate scone. <gasps> that is oh so yummy. And then I did a, uh, what did I do, Malia? Uh, lemon, did I do the lemon and the lemon curd, and I, did I do a lemon thyme? No? Did I just do a plain scone? Did I just do two scones? I thought I did two, three. I don't remember what the third one was. I think it might have just... I think it was a lemon, it was a lemon scone. Um, this is my, my bestest friend, Malia Hodges, is here with her mom and her girls today. Um, and if, you've probably heard me mention Malia's name, if you came to the Baking for Busy Family class, it was helping Malia get started that totally inspired that class. So, if that class has benefited you, then you need to thank Malia for <laughs> deciding to join the bread cult, or else I never would have, I never would have done that class. I guess you should thank her husband for letting her come and buy all that stuff. <laughs> Though he did come home from work to lunch from when I delivered everything, and he was like, what are y'all doing? We had the kitchen completely torn apart. But I did three different scones, and then I took the half pint, uh, like jelly jars, mason jelly jars, and I did the clotted lemon cream that goes with this one. I made my own lemon curd, and then there was one other, um, oh, it was the jam, the mixed berry jam, um, to go with the mixed berry and white chocolate scone, and I put them in the little jelly jars, so there was a topping um, for each type of scone, and so I did the baggies of the scones, and then put the three little jars in there with the fillings, and they were really, really cute, really cute baskets, so holidays are coming up, or if you have a friend that um, really enjoys tea and scones, or if you have a, a British friend or a friend from Ireland or Scotland that lives here that may be missing that sort of thing, that would be um, a wonderful treat. But it was, it really was very, very yummy. All right, we're going to get in here. It's always fun to play when you're allowed to play with your food, right? This is a great job for little fingers. Get your kids involved in the kitchen. While I'm doing this, I want to make sure that you guys know about all the other fun and exciting classes that we've got coming up. Um, definitely be sure to grab a class schedule um, on your way out. We've got them at the front. They're also listed on our website. Um, we've got some really delicious fall classes coming up. Um, we've got a baby food class. If um, you have a friend that is interested in making their own baby food, um, I praise the Lord I'm out of the baby food making phase of my life. Um, yes, amen. I heard an amen. Um, <laughs> I have taught the baby food class before, obviously, when I was having to make baby food. Um, and it's really, it's not that difficult. Don't feel overwhelmed. It's so easy. And with pressure cookers and things like that, it's so fast to make your own baby food and so much healthier for your, for your little ones. And... Um, but my sister, Abby, this will be her uh, class debut. Um, she's going to be teaching that class with my mom. Um, she's expecting her second in November. In fact, I think. Not her mom, my daughter. Yes, yes, no. My mom is not expecting anyone. No, no, um, no. Um, <laughs> hallelujah, mom is out of that phase as well. So, <laughs> Or else her children would be revolting. Um, but my sister Abby is expecting her second. In fact, I think she'll be three weeks away from her due date when she teaches that class. So hopefully we won't have any like labor and delivery baby story. Yes, exactly. All right. Now we're going to add our um, wet mixture, which is um, the molasses and the buttermilk and the egg. And then I'm going to show you a very handy dandy little gadget here in a minute to make the clotted the clotted cream I also um, I love making scones on stones baking stones 
I think that biscuits and scones and things like that really turn out nicely on baking stones. So we sell a line of um, rectangular baking stones as well as um, round pizza stones, which obviously you could make a rectangular pizza. You're not bound to just the round one. Um, but I have them, I've got the ovens preheating back here and I'm preheating the stone in there so that they are nice and hot. You don't have to, you can, you can bake on a stone with the stone being cold and going straight into the oven. Um, but I find that it bakes faster, they plump up really nice and they get nice and crispy if the stone is already hot beforehand. And I see the girls are putting your sandwiches on the bottom plate. All right, let me mix this into here. The trick with biscuits and scones is to not to overwork them. Unlike your, um, your bread dough, that must, your yeast bread dough has to be kneaded to develop the, um, to develop the gluten. Biscuits and scones, you don't want to overwork them or they're going to be heavy and tough and dry. So we don't want to do that. We're just going to work the, the wet in here. There's no rowdy boys here, right? Rowdy boys? I said there's no rowdy boys, Mom. <laughs> boys, you are not a boy. <laughs> we also have another special guest here today. Not only are there, or well, let me ask this. How many grandmothers are here? I like all the grandmothers. And then how many mothers are here? And then how many daughters are here? Yay! Well, we're all, a if you're a grandmother or a mother, then you qualify for all three, right? <laughs> Technically, um, that's, that's very, very exciting. And that makes me very excited that we have a lot of three generations of ladies and families here today. I'm gonna get my extra flour. Um, because there are three, three generations of my family here today as well. My mom, obviously, is Sue Becker, if y'all didn't already know that. And we're going to do this. There we go. <laughs> I can just see, I'd be picking gingerbread dough out of my curls. I'm just going to work this together. And cutting that butter in like that is what makes um, them flaky, having those little bits of dough, of uh, butter and everything and flour mixed together. We're just going to keep kind of folding this over, working that in. But there's my mom is Sue Becker, and she's here. And then my daughter, Catherine, is with us today as well. Aren't you, Uncle? She was excited because she got out of doing homework today. <laughs> we homeschool, and my kids do not have fall break this week, like some of you. So she's going to have to do it later. But she got out of having to do it this morning with the boys in the schoolroom. So we left Daddy and the brothers at home doing school. All right. I find that it's easier to work with scone dough and biscuit dough sometimes if you work with half of it at a time. So we're just going to pat this out. And you can make these as thick as you want and as big around as you want, depending on the, the biscuit cutter or the cookie cutter that you use. Since we are delicate ladies here today, I'm going to use 
These are our cookie cutters that nest together. They are wonderful for um, even bread dough, hamburger buns to cut your bread dough out with, or dinner rolls, cookies, of course, um, biscuits. But I really like this little small one is what I'm going to use to do our little scones with. So they're dainty and delicate. And what I do when I make scones at home, and I've got my, um, my stone heating in the oven, I will just put my, I'll put all my scones over to the side, either on a plate or on, the, on a, another cutting board, something like that. And then I'll take the cutting board to the oven and put all of them in at the same time. So I'm not having to pull out a hot, the hot stone and have them sitting here. What's that? You could. You certainly could. Um, you mean with the tray and just kind of slide it off? They're so little and um, spending days lifting 50-pound buckets of grain. I come home swoosh a little too hard and they all go flying into my oven. So, because I'm so strong. There we go. I'll let this sit for a minute while I work with the other half. Yes, I would love a hand. Um, yeah, if you want to um, actually do this, there's another cutting board somewhere right here. I thought I had a little one. There might be some over there. It's under there. That'll be fine, too. Um, no, that's all right. You know what? I don't know how much the, the nesting cookie cutters are. I can find out. Amanda. Yes, Catherine. Thank you. Oh, man. There's going to definitely be a benefit to having Catherine here. Have her run out, find out all kinds of info for us. Well, this is coming up hard from having these in the oven. This is in Ireland. We're going to talk about different types of teas. And in Ireland, we call this 11's Eve when we have scones and tea. So it's getting close to 11's Eve. So even though we're not doing an afternoon tea, it's actually just in time to have tea in tea Ireland. Tea and scones? Tea and scones, yeah. Thank you, Maggie. 11's Eve, is that what you said? We, yeah. Okay. I have to interpret sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll tell you one of my favorite recipes um, in Judith's cookbook. It's absolutely gorgeous, too. Um, it's a raspberry, and um, and I used mixed berries sometimes. Oh, Catherine, did you find out? Ten dollars for the nesting cookie cutters. Um, but there is a whipping cream and white chocolate, and you use um, steel cut oats to make this little crunchy topping. Um, and I'm actually going to transfer all of these onto the baking stone. So if you want to just okay, just sure, fill that whole thing up, and then I'll move them in just a second. Okay. Um, I'll take it to the oven and put them on. Um, but it's a fantastic recipe. The problem with the recipe is I cannot pronounce it. <laughs> cannot. <laughs> and we made it. Is it. Did we make that one in the for, uh, for Christmas? Was it in the or Christmas, or did we make it in the? Um, I think. Oh no! I think maybe I've made it in a separate class okay. without you. Yeah. But when you came in at St. Patrick's Day and we did that class together. I had to have you pronounce it for me, so go ahead, say it. It's a Gaelic word called cronachan, and you have to get the ch, because I know... Yeah, but I don't want to spit all over your food. See, that's the problem. I know the GH must be silent, and because my name is McLaughlin, but a lot of, in American, you, you say McLaughlin, you put an F sounding, but we do the ch, so you have to get, if you come over to Ireland, you have to get to practice the GH at the back of the throat. <laughs> yes, yes, so let's all practice it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Lovely ladies making horrible sounds, right? <laughs> but yeah, so um, I just call it, um, I call it Kraken. We do uh, raspberry Kraken. Um, 
Malia and I actually call it just plain old delicious because <laughs> it's fantastic. I think the first time I ever made it was for you for your birthday. Her husband and uh, they came over and um, on her birthday and we had coffee and dessert and I made that and um, there was not a single ounce of it left when we were done. So um, it's very, very tasty. All right, we are almost done with this. And then the tea bread is going to go. We're going to mix that up which is so easy. I cannot wait to show you this bread because it is a wonderful recipe. I think we have plenty of scones. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, definitely. These goes too well with the lemon curd. We're going to be serving this with the clotted cream and lemon curd and the, the ginger the flavors are just fantastic. And especially, as Ashley said, for the holidays, uh, you always think about Christmas time with the gingerbread and cozy around the fire and hot chocolate and mm -hmm. these scones are just a really fantastic recipe. Alrighty, there we go. <coughs> well, while Ashley's putting those together, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the three different types of tea. And of course, I've just told you about 11 of these is what we have in Ireland, which is at 11 o'clock. But many of you have heard of cream tea Cream tea is basically, it's more a light tea that would obviously have the, the milk with the, the tea. And then it would have scones or uh, muffins. So it's really a very light tea. If somebody would call to your home in Ireland or in England, and, and of course in the side as well, often you'd offer a basic cream tea, which is a, the simplest of all the teas. And then moving up, we would look at afternoon tea. And this is really afternoon tea that we're going to be serving you today. The afternoon tea always has the traditional three-tier cake stand. And when we're serving tea, we always work from the bottom up. We start off with our savouries at the very bottom. And then from that, we move up the tray to our breads. And then the finale is going to be the sweets, which is at the top tier. And because we have so much amazing bread, and the, the bread bakers, the, the, the bread is so fabulous, it's really fresh. And obviously sometimes I remove the crust from it, but the bread is so good, we just cannot wait to eat this amazing bread. So with the sandwiches, are, they're ve we're very generous, and I know that you hope that you're all hungry because we've got lots of sandwiches. So traditionally, they would be all in one layer, but we have two layers of sandwiches that you're all going to be served. And just let me tell you a little bit about the savouries that we're going to be serving you. The first one is called a coronation chicken salad. And for those of you, I'm from the north of Ireland, and so obviously we have a lot of influence with the UK and with Great Britain. And of course, God save the Queen. And she just celebrated the Jubilee. And I was over in Ireland for the Jubilee. And in June, I led a culinary tour of a group of Americans that came over and we, and we did a tour of Northern Ireland and, and Dublin as well, the south of Ireland as well. And we just found it, found it so delightful. We were driving through some areas in Belfast and we saw all these children out with the little tea sets all having tea outside in their garden. And everybody was just really in the celebration with all the, the flags, right, the red, white and blues. Everybody was celebrating the Jubilee. And I know that there's been lots of signature tea foods that have been created especially for that day and drinks at the time of eating a celebration and time to celebrate uh, tea and of course the coronation chicken salad it's going back to Queen Elizabeth who was crowned queen in 1953 or 52 so therefore it was 60 year anniversary with the jubilee that we just celebrated in, in the UK but the chicken salad was created just for her so that's what we're going to be serving. And it does have got some mango chutney, and it's got curry powder and apricots. The recipe's in the cookbook. Obviously, with the UK, you've got those influence with the Indian influence with the British Empire extending all that way. So you've got those wonderful uh, flavors that come through so, in so many of the classic British recipes. Uh, so that's what you have. And of course, in the South, you love chicken salad as well. Again, the commonalities between Ireland and the American South. And I love the tea rooms in the American South, seeing that beautiful tarragon flavors that's coming into your chicken salad, which are so good. And I always uh, just love you, the yummy southern chicken salad. And I have the recipe in my cookbook, but I also have the British version where I contrast the two. So you've got uh, two different recipes. Then the second sandwich that we have 
It's wonderful for vegetarians because it is grated apple and carrot and cheese. And we bind that together with a little mayonnaise. And you could avoid the mayonnaise if you want. It would just still come together without that. Some chopped parsley. And it's just absolutely wonderful filling. We were, Ashley and I, were, we had, had a little one for breakfast yes, we did. <laughs> when we were here prepping. It was just delicious. And it's, it's really, and you can add nuts as well if you want to get some more protein there. But it's a fabulous sandwich. It's one of my favorites. And my grandmother used to make it. It's one of her fillings that she used to, to put together. And uh, so you can, and it's a lovely color as well. Nice presentation when you stack it on the side. It's a sandwich that's kind of cut in a triangle at the very bottom. And it's stacked on the side. And you can put a little bit of parsley to set it off. Then moving up the tray, we have our traditional roast beef sandwich. And again, in the UK, we always have the Sunday dinner, which is the roast beef and the Yorkshire pudding, the potatoes. So it's always kind of part of what is expected in a traditional afternoon tea in the UK. And uh, obviously, beef is something that we, we do love, our beef in Ireland, because as I've mentioned before, the cattle roam free. There is no hormones in our cattle. It's completely banned in Europe. And again, the cattle have, are eating grass. They're, we all say they're very happy cows. And it produces great meat, great produce. And of course, everything we have in the Bread Beckers, it's all organic. This is grass-fed beef that we're serving you today, uh, which is you know the boar's head, right, which is always the, the grass-fed that you do have in your local supermarkets, which is fantastic beef. So we have that. And it's garnished with some roasted red pepper and some caramelized Vidalia onion. And then we're putting a little bit of thyme on the top of that, which is almost like a little rose, a little petal, a little flower coming out, which looks so pretty. And then the fourth sandwich is a, it's basically it's a little bit of a twist on the traditional cucumber sandwich, which you cannot simply have afternoon tea without some form of cucumber sandwich. That is a <laughs> quintessential <laughs> afternoon tea. And there's so many things that you can do with your cucumber sandwiches. It's wonderful with cream cheese and dill. It's wonderful with a little bit of ranch dressing and mayo and your cucumber. And you can, sometimes when I make it, I cut the bread in circles. It's a little bit wasteful for the bread. Uh, but if, you know, the bread breakfast bread, we can't waste a scrap of it because it's so, so fantastic. But uh, it is wonderful if you cut that little circle out with a cookie cutter. And then the slice of the cucumber just sits perfectly on that little circle. And some, when I do tea, sometimes I garnish it with a little bit of smoked paprika over the top of it. And it just it looks so pretty. So that's another idea. Today for the cucumber, I actually, I, I got a potato peeler and I took the, the cucumber off. I peeled it that way, avoiding the seeds. And then we marinated it overnight in some vinegar, in some what type of vinegar was it? It was white wine white, vinegar. White wine vinegar and a little bit of salt. So, so that's been marinated in the bag. And we have that finely put on top of the sandwich. And just to give it a Georgia twist, because my food, it's either Irish with a Southern twist or Southern with an Irish twist. So because you all love your peanuts in Georgia, I have got some roasted peanuts that have been folded into the cream cheese and some natural honey. So that comes together at the base of your sandwich. And then we have the cucumber on top. So it's kind of a, a little bit of a Southern twist on a very classical Irish sandwich. So they're just some of the, the sandwiches. And of course, I absolutely love making sandwiches. It's one of my favorite things. And just to give you a few little tips about sandwich making, when you're making sandwiches, especially ahead of time, I put a tiny little bit of butter, very, very thin on that. The reason why you put a little bit of butter is it stops your sandwiches from getting soggy. So that's going to seal in your bread. And you just make sure your butter's at room temperature. Put a tiny, tiny little skim of butter that will seal in the moisture. And because I, I do a lot of catering for teas, and it's, it's so time consuming, that's why I had to go and help. Because these sandwiches, they, they look easy, but everyone has to be just put together. And it's extremism. It's very, very time consuming to prepare a tea. And what I like to do is, number one, I always make my fillings, sometimes even two days in advance, if I have a big crowd or if I'm entertaining. And the other thing is, the day before, there are some sandwiches that you can prepare ahead of time. What you do is you get your sandwich, and you put them together. And if you put a damp tea towel 
linen tea towel, just, just little bits damp and put that over your sandwich tray. That will seal in the moisture for the sandwich and keep it in your refrigerator and your sandwiches will be perfect if they're made the night before or the day before. And of course, when you're entertaining, you want to be able to enjoy your guests, enjoy company. You don't want to be all stressed, you know, to trying to and flustered making sandwiches. You want to, it's all about relationships and spending that time together. So my opinion is whatever you can do in advance, do it. If you can make it the day before or the night before, so you can be relaxed and enjoy your company. So that's kind of some of the tips. And generally, we like to remove, the, as I say, the crusts from the sandwiches. You can, do, you can be so creative with the bread. And there's endless things that you can do with the toppings. And it's just really about you creating a menu and your, make your own memories, create your own sandwiches. And the most important thing is just having, having fun, and especially with the, the decorating. And it's lovely for a mother, daughter, see so many children that are here today. And it's, it's fun to be able to help your mum to, to prep. We had a wonderful helper. We had Ashley's daughter. Where, where is she? She's passing out plates. She's passing out plates. She was amazing. She was buttering the bread for us and, and just tweaking. She was just really, really helped the production line. And again, it's all those memories and, uh, that you're passing and sharing together. And I wanted to tell you, um, if you do, if you decide to cut your crusts off your bread to make them delicate, don't throw those crusts away. Um, a great thing to use your um, your bread crust for, especially on your homemade bread, because the crust is not like bread in the store where it's hard. Um, your crust on your homemade bread is going to be very soft. Um, go ahead and throw it in your blender or your food processor and blend it up to make your own bread crumbs. Dump your bread crumbs in a gallon plastic zippy bag and just have them in your freezer. And then that way you have bread crumbs whenever you need them and you're not having to waste your nice loaf of bread making bread crumbs for, um, for a dish. So that's, um, that's a great tip to have bread crumbs ready and available for you when, you're, when you need them. So mm -hmm. um, are you ready for me to make the other bread? Yes. Y'all go yes. ahead and start yeah. enjoying your sandwiches. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to put together this next bread okay. recipe and then we're going to make some tea for you to have with your sandwiches, mm -hmm. okay? The next recipe I'm going to make for you is um, it's a tea bread. And it is the Old Irish Tea Bread, um, and that's going to be on page 89 in the cookbook. So I'm going to turn there really quick. Um, what I love, love, love about this recipe, and while I'm talking, I'm just going to zest. Um, I'm going to zest this orange really quick into my into my dry ingredients. This is our um, zester that we have, um, and. Uh, Chef Lars is a German chef, and he actually taught me, taught mom and I both, to zest. You know, I've always grated and zested things like this, but you're constantly having to flip it over to see, make sure you haven't gone too far down into the white pithy part. And so he actually taught us to hold the orange like this and go in a rotating motion, and that way you can see and make sure that you're not getting too far down into the orange or the lemon or the lime or whatever um, you're using. Um, if you have come to our dehydration classes, then we have taught you how to use the entire orange to slice your orange and dry them in your dehydrator, and then you grind the entire dehydrated sliced orange in your food processor to make your own <coughs> orange zest using the entire, the whole orange. Um, this zester is very, very nice. This is um, a line of, we have the zester and we also have the box grater from this company. And uh, they are microplaned, and so they are very sharp, but they do a fantastic job. Um, you'll notice on this recipe, when I started looking at it and really looking at the ingredients, I went, oh, this is like an Irish version of fruitcake. That's what this is. <laughs> And I am not a fan of traditional American fruitcake at Christmas time. I'm just so not a fan. If you are, then that's fantastic. I think you'll like this better. Um, dump that there. Where's the icing for the cupcakes? The icing is um, on the door of the refrigerator here. Hold on one second. Oh, not the door. I meant this. Oh, this is for the cupcakes, and this is for the oatmeal cookies because that's the coffee and that's the plain. Um, 
Will you bring me one of each, a cookie and a cupcake really quick? We're gonna go ahead and de decorate the desserts for you, but I wanted to show you, this is actually, this is our cupcake decorating kit that we carry here at the Bread Beckers that I'm using this morning. And it comes, um, it comes with a little spreader, is what it comes with. And then it also comes with this little core. So if you wanted to core out the center of your cupcakes and fill it with frosting or jelly or jams, things like that, uh, chocolate ganache would be fantastic. Um, and then it also, it comes with these two little decorators with the two different tips. Um, I've made two different buttercreams for you and I'm actually gonna show you how I make that so that you know that you can make your own buttercream frosting and just how easy it is. Um, but I've made um, the caramel buttercream frosting straight from um, Judith's cookbook. And I'm just gonna decorate this. I might have let it, let it get a little too cold. You may need to let it sit out, girls, before you decorate. There's that one. And then this is ac actually a coffee buttercream that we're gonna put. I know, right? Nobody's, nobody's complaining about that, right? We're gonna let these get a little warm because I put them back in the fridge because it was so hot up here, it was starting to get really loose. So now we're just gonna let them warm back up a little bit. And then we're going to drizzle um, the top of the cupcake with the caramel that I made. So, all right, so here's this. But you will have so much fun with those. And those are, those are really easy um, and kid friendly to let your kids help decorate. Here's the caramel, it's nice and warm now. Um, but anyway, so that's a nice, and that would be a nice gift. Um, for your girls and it is it's $19.99 for the set okay <laughs> so I know we're kind of jumping around a little bit on the recipes, but you know we're we're also trying to make it so that when we get done explaining everything and making the food for you, you guys can sit back and enjoy just eating and fellowshipping together. So back to the old Irish Earl tea bread. You'll notice that Judith suggests a mixed dried fruit, and she suggests dried cherries, cranberries, and blueberries. And then you also use glazed cherries. And I asked her, I said, do you mean like candied cherries that go in fruitcake? And she said, yes. And I went, okay. So um, I had to go out to our little section in the Bread Beckers. We now carry a whole line of spices, dried fruits, and some nuts and things like that. And so I went, hmm, what do we have that I can choose from? Hey, Mom, when you get a second, will you come check the scones? I think they might be ready. So what I did is I took a mixture of our dried cranberries that are sweetened with apple juice. Um, our, I used our golden raisins is what I used. And then I chopped and diced our dried apricots. So that was my three fruit mixture instead of the cherries, cranberries, and blueberries. And then in place of the glazed cherries, I knew that that was gonna be more of that sticky texture is what I wanted to go for. And so I mashed up um, a handful of our dried dates. I pitted them and used the dates instead of the glazed cherries. And then what you do is you put that in a bowl and you use your cup of cold Earl Grey tea that's left over from, from tea, which Earl Grey tea, and I'll have Judith explain it a little bit more, has a very, very um, fruity essence to it. It's very orangey, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, let me, let me, Throw this together and then I'll let you explain Earl Grey. Um, so you let that steep in your dry fruit overnight um, with the brown sugar, which I used Sucanot there. Um, and then you mix up your dry ingredients, your flour and your, um, I think it calls for self-rising flour. So I've given you those measurements again, the cinnamon and the nutmeg, and then the zest of the orange. And then you're just gonna mix the egg in which I doubled this recipe, so I'm actually doing two loaves for you. I did 
didn't realize how much I was going to be saying the word orange. Malia likes it when I say that. She says that I say it funny. Because I say orange and not orange. Okay, but that's my that's the southern my southern heritage coming out. Because if y'all don't know now let me ask you this. Who in here this is your first time to the breadbackers? Anybody? Oh how nice. Yes, this is going to be a lot of the kids their first time coming to a breadbackers class because sometimes they our our classes are a little long and they're not as kid friendly. So we like doing these special classes. This is considered a quick bread um, because it's just a stir up recipe. There's no kneading necessary. This would be a fantastic bread, breakfast bread, um, to have left over because of all that dried fruit. It's just absolutely delicious. I am actually not a, um, I don't typically like cooked fruit. So not, like I don't like apple pie, I don't, I don't care for things like that. Um, I've never been a really big um, raisin fan, um, but this, I don't know if it's the combination of the raisins and the cranberries, um, and the dates and the apricots, but they are just, it's absolutely fabulous. I'm really excited to, to make this for you. Um, I'm gonna be putting this, like I said, I doubled this recipe so that we could have two loaves of it to make sure that we had plenty for everyone. And I was instructed by one of the employees that her husband wanted her to bring some of this home. So <laughs> we'll be making sure that we have plenty of that. All right, I'm going to just divide this between my two loaves. These are our um, USA bakeware. They are completely non-stick. They're coated in silicone. Oh, and I found a patch of flour that did not get mixed in. So I'm give that another quick stir. you don't have to spray them at all and they bake really really nice they're a commercial weighted steel and then they are coated in the silicone silicone bakeware became very popular several years back but it was that flimsy stuff that you had to have the the stand and I was like I just don't understand that that seems like it's just gonna get in the way of everything and so we never we never carried the silicone um, pans and then when mom and dad went to Chicago this past year, they met this company. And one of our favorite things about them is obviously the name being the USA Pan Company. They're made right here in the US. So um, that's always encouraging to be supporting US companies. All right, so now we're just gonna put these right into the oven. Um, and they bake for 45 minutes. So we'll enjoy those in just a bit. And then I want to make for you the, um, the clotted lemon cream that's gonna go on the gingerbread scones because I know we wanna kinda serve those warm. And so I wanted to show you what I used yesterday to make those. This is our um, stick blender made by L'Equip, and it comes with several different, um, it's an immersion blender is what it is, and it comes, you probably recognize it like this. Immersion blenders are fantastic for soups and things like that, they're absolutely wonderful. Well, this particular model comes with, um, I'm gonna wipe up this really quick. It comes with several other attachments, several other blades that actually fit onto the immersion wand um, so that it chops or blends or mixes and things like that. It also comes with this little food processor bowl that has the blade down in the bottom. So if you'll flip back to the, um, the gingerbread scones on page 125, we're gonna make the clotted, um, the clotted lemon cream. I wanted to show you how I did that. took my softened cream cheese and it calls for 
three ounces of the cream cheese. Did y'all enjoy the sandwiches? Were they so good? Um, that, that was all of it. I can, but I can make more in just a minute and we can do that. Since we don't have to serve, they're not going to eat those just yet. So I'll make some in just a second. Um, so I've got my three ounces of my cream cheese and then, mom, can I get the zester back, please? I think it already got whisked away to the, oh, there it is. I'm going to do a pinch of salt. Nope, I'm just going to do orange. Fabulous. I mean, lemon. So I've got the zest of my lemon that I'm putting right into here. I'll tell you what, Catherine, can you bring me the little dish off your table that has the honey granules, please? Because I need a spoon of that. So there's the zest of our lemon. Thank you, madam. I'll let you take it right back. How about that? I'm going to do our tablespoon of honey granules instead of the white sugar. Okay. And now I'm just going to put our lid on here. This fits right down. And there, that is our salt, our pinch of salt, our honey granules, our cream cheese, and our the zest of the lemon. Now, the fun part. I'm going to add our one cup of our heavy whipping cream. I'm just going to put this right in like that. I'm just going to use my little spatula just to go kind of around the edge and get that cream cheese off the edge so it gets good and mixed in. All right. Now I'm going to put my lid on. If you can see, but I'm going to show you. It has made the softest whipped cream that has that um, cream cheese completely mixed in as well. And this is what they would call a clotted, um, a clotted cream. Um, so that's your clotted lemon cream that the girls um, are going to use um, to serve on the scones with a little bit of the lemon curd as well. I want Judith to come and talk about, um, about tea. We're going to talk about tea and I want to serve you a couple of different kinds. I've got some spiced apple chai that's already steeping. Um, I've also got some wild strawberry for the girls if they would like some of that. And then we're going to also um, talk about, uh, and then I'm gonna, we're going to steep some gingerbread tea for you as mm -hmm. well, okay? But I want Judith to come and talk about tea and yeah. just the, the fun aspects of that. Yeah. And just to mention Earl Grey, it has a, a, the bergamot flavor, which is that wonderful citrus, which is amazing in bread. I just love the flavor. You can use any type of tea for this particular bread. And of course in Ireland we can also make it with Guinness or with beer, you can also steep it in that overnight and it works out to be very moist and delicious or whatever type of tea, black tea, herbal tea, any type of tea, it's really just infusing the flavor into the fruit. Uh, but I think that the Earl Grey goes very well, uh, particularly with tea and the I know the bergamot uh, was actually given as a gift from China to Lord Grey, 
who was a diplomat, a British diplomat, and they gave him the gift, and then he, he started to fuse that, and it became famous in the UK uh, with that, that distinct flavor. And it, it, it is very, very delicious, and there's a, a decaf version of it, or a, a regular tea, and it goes very well with savories or with sweets. And I know traditionally with pairing tea, you want to go for, with your savouries, either a green tea, which is more of a savoury tea, or else a black tea, which isn't going to fight with the flavours of your savouries. It's going to pair together. When it comes to your sweet things, you can go for teas that are fruity, that have different flavours, like your rooibos and you can tie that in, like the strawberry tea we're serving today, the gingerbread. So you can definitely be more adventurous when it comes to your sweet items and when it comes to serving your scones and your teas. But I always go for a tea, as I say, a, a green tea, something that's gonna complement your savory. So just be careful when you're serving tea, what you're pairing. And it, we're, we're going to be serving, we like to serve a dessert tea, uh, maybe two different types of tea when you're having a special tea and you want to switch out your tea, and that also adds fun and interest as well. And the other thing I wanted to mention was, of course, that clotted cream is also known as Devonshire cream in England, and that is a very tradition, the clotted cream to serve with here. It almost has a, a tangy kind of taste, almost like that, that buttermilk that you get that sort of isn't quite as rich and sweet, because the thing about afternoon tea is that you don't want to be killed with sweet things because you've got so many different bites to try and I think it's uh, you don't want to be kind of uh, feeling oh gosh I've had too many sweet things and I think it's in some people make that mistake when they're putting together an afternoon tea it can just be too sweet and I like to have as many savory items kind of focus on that with your more sav savory breads and scones so that you can really it's almost really to be a meal when you have afternoon tea that should be enough to replace your, your dinner and of course when I went on to talk about afternoon tea I didn't mention high tea a uh, high tea in Ireland, it's basically what we say, we call breakfast, lunch, and tea. And if you're asked for tea in Ireland, it doesn't mean this type of tea, it actually means that you're going to have a, a dinner that would always finish with your breads and tea. And in Ireland, we always finish off every meal with a cup of tea, and then we would include, uh, our main meal would have been traditionally in lunch time, and then when we, when we talk about tea, you would have um, some type of hearty, savory dish that would fill you up, maybe a bowl of warm stew or a shepherd's pie or some type of hearty one-pot dish, and then would always accompany bread, maybe scones, tea bread like we're having today, and obviously a cup of tea. So that's when we talk about high tea. If you're invited for high tea, it really is a full meal that would finish with your bread, scones, tea, and maybe dessert. So while we are getting ready to serve your tea, I wanted to talk about a few other things. One of them is gonna be your tableware and serving pieces. And then I also wanted to talk about tea party etiquette as well. So for our tableware and serving pieces, if you have a look over to this table, you'll see that traditionally we always have a place mat and then we have our plate. If we're having the afternoon tea, we can have a larger plate of, with a linen napkin that is folded. And then we always have an extra, if we're serving a larger plate, we always have a smaller plate over to the left that we can have for our sweet items. And then we obviously have our teacup and spoon. And then we have our serving pieces. We have the little for the sugar cubes, which are traditional, we have the little tongs especially for that. And then we have the tongs as well, the serving pieces that you can lift the sandwich directly from there. And Moving on, uh, the, the tea cosy as well as traditional to have. The purpose of the tea cosy, it's not because it looks cute and it does, it does, it does have a purpose. The idea is that we, we steep the tea and I know that Ashley's gonna be talking more about tea uh, for the properties and the health benefits of tea. Uh, but just to tell you more the traditional way, the teapot would have been always, uh, put a little bit of boiling water to heat the tea and that's going to create a fusion for your teapot. You discard that water, you make sure for black teas and rooibos, you want to make sure that the, your water is at a roaring boil before you use that. If you're making green tea, you let the tea go off the boil for about uh, five minutes. It's meant to be very hot but not boiling. 
because if you burn the green tea, then it's going to be, it's not going to have a good taste. So you always keep that off the boil. But for your rooibos and your black tea, you want to add your tea and go ahead and uh, add your boiling water and you let it fuse for just a few minutes and then extract the tea. Uh, the rooibos, you can let it sit for as long as you want, but black tea gets really bitter if you steep it for longer than about three minutes. So you want to get that out of there, get the tea bags of using that out of there, tea leaves. And then you want to put your tea cozy over that, which is going to keep your tea uh, lovely and cozy and warm. And that, that was the idea of the tea cozy, which is traditional to serve in, in Ireland when you have afternoon tea. That's the, the practical purpose and of do that. You, do you mind if, if sure. Do you mind if I, I'm going to step in really quick just because I want to um, get this out so that we can serve you ladies. We're serving the little girls some wild strawberry tea that I steeped, but I wanted to show you, um, I'm just using this as a container at the moment, um, but these are our Adagio tea kettles. It's one way of steeping your loose tea. Um, what's nice about them is that they drain right into your container. So even if you were just having a cup of tea, just you and a friend or for you personally, then you can steep your loose tea here. This is enough for 16 ounces and you would just drain it right into your own cup, okay? Um, I made this a little strong because I'm going to add a little bit more. I made it basically a concentrate and then I'm going to fill it the rest of the way up with some hot water um, so that there's enough for everybody to go around. We have it in the large size and the small size. Um, and then we also have, this is the, uh, mom, I can never remember how to pronounce this. Takia? Takia is the other, and that's what this big, this big pitcher is. These are um, actually like instant iced tea uh, brewing pots is what this is. Um, basically, you can put your loose tea in the basket here, and then you fill the pitcher. Um, and this is actually a two, a two pot set. And you'll notice here, this is more strawberry tea if we need it, Mom. It's ready to go. Um, there's the basket with my loose tea and you fill this with your boiling water and you steep your tea in there. And then what you're meant to do if you wanted to make iced tea, which I love the herbal fruity teas as iced tea. Um, I actually do not buy juice for my kids anymore um, just because it may be 100% juice, but you don't know where that juice came, those, that fruit came from and what its growing conditions were. So I do not buy juice for my kids um, anymore. I would rather do the herbal teas, um, which I will go ahead and tell you herbal tea actually um, typically does not have any tea in it whatsoever. Um, so it's decaffeinated. Herbal teas are typically fruits and flowers that are dried, um, making it have that flavor. Um, and so this is our wild strawberry. It's probably my kid's favorite of the teas. And so what I do is I will steep my loose tea and my boiling water, and then you would fill this pitcher completely with ice, and you would put your sweetener in there. I like to sweeten my cold teas with our raw agave nectar because it dissolves in cold things instantly. It doesn't get gooey like honey would. Um, and then you pour this, your hot brewed tea over the pitcher of ice. You screw the lid on. It's completely um, spill proof. So you can put it in like a picnic basket or something like that. But with the ice and everything, it slowly starts to melt the ice. It's instantly iced tea um, and it has the lid as well. Um, and so that's very, very nice. Um, so those are a couple of different ways um, for brewing that we, that we sell here, obviously. We also have the little, um, we have the individual cups that you would put your loose tea in and put down, um, it's like a little basket that you would put down in. We have started carrying Earl Grey tea. Um, it comes in this little box and it actually, you pull this out and so it dispenses one bag at a time and the tea is actually in a little baggie inside this little pouch. So this would be very easy to stick in your purse, very easy to have um, tea out and about. All you have to do is then order a cup of hot water at any restaurant. Um, this is a new way I wanted to show you. This is a new product for us. I wanted to show you how you would use it. Um, we also sell these glass containers to keep your loose tea in if you would like to. This is our new um, our new tea thing. Snaps 
back together. These are electric water kettles that are so nice, especially when you have a fake kitchen like ours that does not have hot running water. But it's got the holes in the little basket so that you can steep. Then when you're when you're done steeping, you can squeeze the ball together to squeeze all the loose tea and then take it out. So that's how you could make an individual cup. Um, I think these are going to make fantastic Christmas gifts, teacher gifts. Um, they retail for $14.95 and they come in lots of different colors. Um, also, we sell a line, um, our line of loose tea, we sell in bulk in the one pound bags. If you find a particular, like the wild strawberry that you want to make for your kids on a regular basis, it's definitely cheaper to go ahead and buy it in bulk. We also have everything, all of our loose teas in small two ounce bags so you can sample them. Um, but I think that this paired with a couple of the little baggies of loose tea would make a fantastic um, teacher gift or to put in gift baskets at Christmas time and things like that for someone that you know really enjoys um, tea. So that is a very easy way to steep your single cup um, of tea. So I wanted to show you that um, as well. Yes, ma'am. A certain, um, there is, there is. Um, and usually it will say, depending on which kind of tea it is, it'll say use a teaspoon of this per cup. Now you need to understand too that tea and tea cups are not eight ounce cups. They're typically about six ounces. Um, so my typical for iced tea, if I was gonna make an herbal iced tea, an entire pitcher of it, um, I usually make a half a gallon at a time. And so I steep a third of a cup of loose tea for my half gallon of iced herbal tea. Um, I've got some handouts and I'll make sure that the girls get some printed. Um, but at Christmas time, we also serve some tea lattes. We have several fantastic flavors and we're gonna serve one of them for you in a little bit. Um, one of them is called Valentine's tea. Um, it's a black tea. Black teas are typically, they are caffeinated, black teas are. So just know that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna Fill this the rest of the way up with my water. And then ladies, if y'all want to serve, this is the gingerbread um, tea, if y'all would like some of this. Um, but the, uh, the, I was talking about the Valentine. The Valentine tea is a black tea um, and it tastes just like chocolate covered strawberries. Um, we have another one um, that's candy cane. Um, that's fantastic that I actually make into a very, very strong tea, sweeten it, and then fill my container the rest of the way up with milk. Um, and so it's more of a latte then. And that's good. It's good cold or hot, either, either way. Um, the Valentine's tea is also excellent. We're going to serve that one um, in a little bit. It's going to be one of our uh, dessert teas. Um, it's going to be the Valentine's tea. Um, but these are our savory teas. Um, is the gingerbread. And then um, I'm also going to, um, actually, no, this is spiced apple chai that I made for you to have um, with your savory sandwiches. And then I'm gonna also, I'm gonna turn around and I'm gonna brew some gingerbread for you as well to try in just a second. So I'm gonna put this off and I'm sorry, Judith, I totally interrupted you. So if you wanna keep, come keep talking about the tea and oh. tea etiquette, that wasn't very, yeah. Polite was it that I just totally I'm not took sure if that was tea etiquette that, that she interrupted not. me. I, you know, it wasn't. We're going to have to. It wasn't. Can I have a hug? Does that make up for it? Yes. <laughs> I'll allow you to lift your little pinky when you're having a cup of tea, even oh, though that's not etiquette, but you can you, you can, can do that as a matter of okay. yes. All right, good. <laughs> so uh, we also we've got a final dessert as well. We have the apple fools that, that we're gonna be talking about, uh, which is the fools uh, is basically, and it's a French word, foulet, which means to crush. And that's going to be any type of fruit that you have that would be seasonal that you can crush. In my cookbook, I have a Georgia peach fools where I have with fresh Georgia peaches. But because this is a full, we're going to be making it with apples. And you can do that with whatever is in the garden. My grandmother had a garden that had grew absolutely everything under the sun. And she used to make it with gooseberries that was very popular, or rhubarb and strawberries. So you can combine any type of fruit that you want, and you, you'll see we're going to, to do that demo in a few, in a few minutes. We'll get that, that, that together. 
So I just want to tell you a little bit, again, we went over the traditional serving pieces. And again, it's all about having fun and having the, the children maybe get together. And you may have a little play set as well for the kids, which makes it fun. Maybe they could have a children's table when you have tea so they can have their own play set and they can have turns to pour the tea and, and have little sandwiches. You can even do peanut butter and jelly sandwiches cut into fun shapes, just whatever the kids enjoy just to make it fun for them. And that's what I, I like to do when I have parties. I like to have a little uh, an adult table and then have a little one just for the children. And, and obviously dress up for tea is fun. I, I have a, a dress up closet as well. I have a trunk of clothes that I get in garage sales. Uh, you might get dresses that you put and you want to get the children to uh, dress up and put them and I have hats and gloves and, and that's all, all just a, a lot of fun she to do. She even makes garage sale sound elegant, doesn't she? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we go garage selling and uh, yeah, but she makes it sound pretty and dainty. <laughs> and everything is better with an accent, I've decided. Okay, go ahead. And then traditionally they like to serve little slices of lemon as well. People, some people don't like to have milk in their tea, but they might like to have lemon. So you could have a little dish of lemon sitting there that people can do. And just to let you know about the, the rules as well, the etiquette rules for pouring tea. And it's basically, it's a real, it's the, the job of the host is to pour the tea. And it's considered uh, their job, but if you've got more than probably six people, you need to, the duties need to be shared for pouring tea. And normally the host, if there's several girlfriends, you normally appoint your closest friends to pour the tea. And it's a real honor to be asked to do that. And normally we have in a tea party for etiquette, if you've got several people, you might say, give your friends, you're in charge for the first 20 minutes for pouring the tea, and then you can move the job to another friend so the one person isn't stuck with pouring tea for the entire time. And when you're pouring tea, keep the cup down, sitting uh, where it is, and then pour directly into the cup. Don't have people pass the tea because you don't want to avoid spilling and because tea is hot, and you want to be able to drink that, that straight away. So in, in Ireland, it's considered the mother's job to pour the tea. And then when you get up a little bit bigger in age, like some of these girls, then when you're asked to pour the tea, you know you've become a big girl. So that's kind of how you progress, and uh, it's, always, it's always an honor. So uh, that, that's a, a little bit of information that you may or, or may not have known. And uh, basically, another thing is that when, you are, when you're pouring your cup, it's like three quarters full. Uh, just like when you're pouring a glass of wine, you don't pour it completely full. You, it's three quarters full. So it's the same with a teacup. You don't want to pour your tea to it's overflowing. And uh, then we traditionally put the milk in first. There's normally cream and sugar is normally served with the tea. And traditionally we put a little bit of milk in first of all with the black tea. But then with some of the herbal teas, uh, you, you may not want, it doesn't necessarily need milk. And you certainly don't put milk into green tea because it will curdle. You always drink it just straight. But milk does, the cream does really pair very well with black teas and also with your rooibos. And as Ashley said, rooibos, uh, all tea comes from the Camellia sinensis plant. And, but your rooibos, that's basically a, a herb from, from South Africa and some of your other herbal teas are obviously not, as Ashley's pointed out, they're not tea at all, but uh, they are obviously fun to drink and enjoyable. And there really is no right or wrong regarding what you drink. It's really what you enjoy. I know they say that about good wine as well. It's just really what, you don't have to have white with white meat or you don't have to have red with red meat. And just like tea, it's just really about you enjoying and what you have fun with and what tastes good to you. So you build up your own traditions. And then um, just a, a, few, a few other points is that there's no more than 12 inches between you and the table when you're resting your cup and saucer. And if you're standing, you should not hold the cup and saucer while you drink. So when you cup, when you stand, you basically hold the, the saucer and the cup and then drink, uh, drink that way, yes. For example, it would not be good etiquette for me to, to be standing and chatting like this here. If you really want to have good etiquette, you serve like this and you drink your tea nice and close. But of course, in the South, you all know about good etiquette, so I don't need to teach you anything. But when I lived in Boston, Massachusetts for the first time, and uh, when I went over, somebody had me over for donuts and, and coffee. And 
So I was kind of disappointed, but when I moved to the south, a friend said to me, I want to invite you for tea. And I thought, hmm, well, this will be interesting. So I was kind of expecting the donuts and coffee because I just had arrived in the south. And, and I came over, I was blown away because again, she had the traditional uh, three-tier cake stand and she had the white linen tablecloth and the napkin and the teacup and she, it was like unbelievable. It was, it was more styled than what I was used to in Ireland. It was taken to a whole nother level. So I thought, oh, well, I think I like the South. I think <laughs> I'm definitely, I definitely like this here. And I know that you all have got so much to teach me. And tea was introduced, of course, it was an English tradition by the Duchess of Bedford who introduced that to the UK, who felt that she didn't want to have that uh, feeling of getting so close to dinner, so she ordered tea to be served and she made it popular in the UK, but it became famous in America uh, by William Penn, who was a Quaker and he, he founded the state of Delaware, so he made that famous in America and obviously at that time, the colonial times in America, tea was huge. So it's, it's very much, it's part of a, it's considered an English tradition, but I think in the South, you all are very much into tea and into doing it right. And it's, it's part of you, really your American heritage to enjoy those things. And even though it, a lot of credit is given to, to the Queen and to the UK and to English and Irish traditions in Europe, but it is, it's such a rich part of the, the South and you can just see if you go to Marietta or downtown Roswell, you see tea rooms are, are so popular and Woodstock tea leaves and time. You've got all these wonderful places where you can go and dress up and, and have tea. And, and that's a reflection of the, of the love and the traditions that you already have established here in the South. So I know that you're teaching me how to do things right regarding Southern elegance and, and uh, finesse and class. You know, know all about that. And then uh, also with flowers that are edible, there's lots of flowers that you, that you can use to decorate your plate. Uh, obviously organic flowers are better like the rose, the pansy, the English daisy, daylily marigolds as well. Many of you have those in the garden. I like to pull those in. Uh, the sunflower is, uh, is fine and lavender. So you can take any of those and just garnish your plates with the beautiful fresh flowers, add a little bit of mint uh, anything to bring color to your plate and to make everything look pretty. So that's really what it's all about, is uh, just being able to have fun and creating those memories. So are, are we, Ashley, are we, will we walk, talk about through the, the sweets, start to walk, to yeah, basically I'll introduce the, the, the whipped cream? The, um, I'll make, let me make the whipped cream and I'll show them how to make the icing so that they can finish that. Yes. Um, and then the, then the, the filet, will yes. Be, bread is done, we'll okay. that and you guys can enjoy that as well. Um, the scones, I think, uh, are the scones all out and done? So y'all can definitely go ahead and enjoy some of the, the gingerbread scones, put a little bit of lemon curd on them, and then the clotted lemon cream that I made for you. Um, and then, but I wanted to show you, I haven't seen it before, this is our um, whipped cream. before
I was just going to mention the, the cookies because everybody's eating them, the, the little oatmeal cookies. Have we talked much about those? That they are my, there's basically it's like a, a shortbread cookie is always traditional to have, but this is an oatmeal, like an oatmeal shortbread cookie that is absolutely delightful for afternoon tea. It's my grandmother's recipe and Ashley made those and they're absolutely divine and you can, you can talk yes. about. Yes, and actually we'll yeah. talk about that in just a second mm -hmm. when I make the icing um, for yeah. y'all. Yeah. But I did use a cookie mm -hmm. of apple pie seasoning that y'all put in the, I thought that would be a nice yeah. treat since you're going on top of the apples on the cookie thing. So Everybody's eating them, so you might as well. Yeah. Yeah. Just put in some vanilla extract and it would be vanilla cream. Yes. Okay. Sorry, Johnny. I'm getting evil looks from the back. All right. So now what I am taking is um, a pressurized char cartridge, and we're going to pressurize this, and it's going to whip. You, can you hear it? Watch the hair. Listen. You're just going to shake it. Best thing ever, yes. Um, orange extract. We sell a whole line of organic extracts. Um, I served orange flavored whipped cream on pumpkin pie uh, last Thanksgiving, and it was a huge hit. Now you just take the cartridge off. Well, we thought about, I just heard my mom say, we thought about having you guys bring your teacups, um, but then I was so afraid that someone would bring like their grandmother's teacup and it would get dropped on the, on the, stain, on the concrete floor um, and that would not be fun. So I don't think that this goes on this. Mom, do you know the trick to get this on? It will not. No. It's not going down on. I think this one was brand new out of the box. I found it back there on the Maybe it was a return. <laughs> Wasn't that great because I just made a whipped cream in it. All right, hold on. Hold on. Yes, please. Can you reuse them? No, because it's completely empty. When you screw this on, it, there's a pin here that it punctures it and lets it all out. So it's one use. But this stays in your, can stay in your refrigerator for up to two to three weeks, pressurized, if you don't use the whole thing. Um, one Christmas, Mom and I, we were, I think it was the first Christmas after we got these, we were wanting to experiment with different flavors. And so um, we were ready to move on to another, another batch of whipped cream. And, um, but it wasn't empty yet. Oh, I'm slowly getting it. Oh, there we go. I just, it's brand new and it just didn't want to go down in there. There we go. Um, let me show you how this works. Isn't that so pretty? Um, I got it, Mom. Um, it just needed to be worked down in there. It's just brand new. Um, so we were ready to move on to the next flavor. And so Mom just took out a cookie sheet and lined it with wax paper and did little florets with the leftover whipped cream and stuck them in the freezer and then peeled them off and put them in a baggie. And then she just labeled them peppermint, coffee, chocolate, whatever. Um, we sell another product that we carry, um, 
is chocolate syrup and it is agave, raw agave nectar and raw cacao powder. So it's completely raw, um, two to three tablespoons. So this is your sweetener and your chocolate all in one. So two to three tablespoons of this in your pint of whipping cream and then pressurize it. It is like chocolate mousse. It is so, so good. Um, then of course the sky is the limit there. You could certainly add your extracts to that and make a chocolate peppermint a chocolate orange, um, the hazelnut. I mean, this really the sky is the limit. And there again, you control how sweet it is and what the flavors are instead of, but then it's still fun and exciting instead of the aerosol can, right? That's nasty. So I'm gonna let the girls do the mm -hmm. apple and I'm gonna make, I'm gonna show you how I made the buttercream icing. That way they can have the rest of the icing for the rest of the, of the cupcakes and the goodies. All right, so powdered sugar is your typical base for a buttercream frosting. This is our mega blend. And what I have done is I have taken a pound of our honey granules, which we now carry powdered honey granules or powdered sucanat with honey. Um, it's still not 10X powdered sugar, okay? Um, and so I'm just using the regular honey granules or Sucanat with honey is another name for it, okay? And I'm just going to blend this up so that it will powder it. Sorry, I got sidetracked with the tea. Biggest thing to remember with the honey granules or the sucanat with honey is um, do not put it in your grain mill, right? Do not put it in your grain mill. It will turn it to glass, which is no fun. Let's talk about the, um, the oatmeal and sea salt caramel cupcakes on page 159. <clears throat> These were a huge hit the first time that I made them. Um, and I actually did it wrong the first time I made them. Uh, the ingredients list calls for Irish oats. Well, I thought that Judith meant the steel cut oats. And so I took the steel cut oats and I poured the cup and a half of boiling water over them and let them sit steep there for 20 minutes while I got the rest of my ingredients together and built my cupcake. Well. They were, um, the oats were um, like an al dente, so they were still kind of chewy, but it added a really nice texture to the cupcake. Um, and everybody was like, okay, but they weren't expecting it. So as long as you like told them, oh, and there's oats in it, then they were like, oh, okay, they were expecting that kind of crunch to them. They were really good. So then when Judith, Judith came yesterday and we were prepping for the class, I said, I'm gonna go ahead and make the cupcakes yesterday so that they're ready to go. And she's like, okay, perfect. And I said, it is steel cut oats, right? And she's like, no, 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 like just oatmeal, rolled oats. And I went, well, that makes sense. They're not supposed to be crunchy. So, um, but I've done it both ways. And it actually, I, I liked it with the steel cut oats even. It gave it a nice, more, a chewier, more hearty texture. Um, so you can do it either way. So we've got our, um, we've got our one pound of honey granules and our half a cup of butter and our eight ounce package of cream cheese. Yes, ma'am? The gingerbread seed. Is it's right here. Do you know where the bag of it is? I didn't use the bag. I just used the loose okay. thing right there. Um, but you'll need to, you can empty both of these into that pitcher if you want to, and then um, fill it almost to the top with more water. Okay. And that's it. Oh. Yes, they do. All right, so now we've got our softened cream cheese. Okay, no one, no one said that this was low fat, okay? Just putting that out there, but at least it's real ingredients and not yucky frosting from the store. And you're just gonna combine this now, you could certainly add um, the caramel 
sauce recipe is right there listed underneath the recipe. And so for the cupcakes, you add some of the caramel sauce to the buttercream frosting, or you could add, um, I used our organic coffee extract is what I put in some of the icing to make um, the coffee buttercream frosting for the oatmeal cookies um, that we're gonna serve. And I think some of you already got to enjoy. Letting this, um, what I have noticed, my little disclaimer for the honey granules, even if you're using the powdered honey granules, is they do take a bit longer, they take a little bit to dissolve. So if you let the icing sit for just a little bit and then re-blend it, um, it'll be completely smooth and creamy. Um, and then if you let it set up just a little bit in the refrigerator, get a little bit cold, um, then you can pipe with it. And um, I actually, my bread making 201 class is coming up next month. Um, and in that class, I do cakes and cookies and things like that. And I show you the buttercream frosting and we do a chocolate cake with it. Um, the very first time that I taught that class, a lady sent me pictures a couple weeks later where she had done her son's birthday cake. And it was a Scooby-Doo birthday cake. And she had used, of course, she, she used food coloring. But, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Um, to tint the frosting and decorate it. I mean, it looked just like Scooby-Doo. Um, and she used the buttercream frosting using the honey granules and said that it worked absolutely wonderfully. All right, girls, I'm gonna let y'all just have this. There we go. So that we can decorate the rest of those. Go ahead and, um, and turn though to the um, to the classic Irish cookies recipe, which is on page 88. Mm -hmm. It's about up to there, kind of like what I did with the other one. On page 88, I just wanted you um, to see and to see the list of ingredients and see um, what I used there um, as far as the light. Uh, whenever a recipe calls for light brown sugar, I usually cut the amount in half and use part sucanat and part honey granules. And that gives you that a little bit lighter flavor, a little bit lighter in color. Um, instead of using all sucanat, which is your brown sugar substitute, it's very dark brown, kind of richer in your molasses flavor. And then the honey granules is just very light, very sweet. Um, and so I use just like that, this recipe called for a half a cup of soft, light brown sugar. I used a quarter a cup of sucanat and a quarter a cup of honey granules to make that half a cup of light brown sugar. Um, and then I made the, the buttercream topping, the coffee buttercream topping, the very first time I made this recipe. And it was just a little, it was um, a little too much just butter for me. I liked the creaminess of adding the cream cheese um, to that recipe as well. So I think if you make the same buttercream icing um, that we just made and then just use the coffee extract or a little bit of prepared coffee even, if you had some left over and you wanted to make a coffee icing, then you certainly, um, you certainly could. Um, I think we've talked about all of those. Judith, anything else? What else did you want to talk about? Because I'm done with my okay. icing and my cooking yeah. and all that. We're just waiting for yeah. the tea bread to come out. Um, and then we'll cut that and, s and serve that for them warm. Well, if, if you don't mind, can I just take a minute to talk about my tours to yeah, Ireland, absolutely. if that's okay? Absolutely. Uh, I, I led my first tour to Ireland. I brought a group of 15 people over. And I'd love to invite all of you to consider coming to Ireland with me next May 2013. I'm going to be doing two tours, and we've just posted the full itinerary on my website. And you please take up a business card that's here. And my website is on the cookbook if you own a copy of the Shamrock and Peach. And I also have a sign up sheet that I can keep in touch with you. But just to let you know that the tour, it's basically going to be a seven day tour, six nights in Ireland and you would fly directly into Dublin uh, from Atlanta, there's a direct flight. And the moment you get to Ireland, you have not, nothing to think about for the entire week. We have a private uh, a driver that has a lovely uh, Mercedes coach that is going to transport you around for the week. And we're gonna be staying in five star, all five-star hotels. We've got really uh, very good rates to stay in amazing hotels. And this is a wonderful mother-daughter 
trip as well to do together and uh, we, we always believe in our family and trying to invest whatever money we have into adventures and travel and, and having those times together. And so have a look at that and think about a mother and daughter treat and maybe you could have a traditional afternoon tea at one of the hotels. The first hotel we're staying in Belfast is called the Merchant Hotel. And it was a, it's a really old, it was an old Irish bank that was taken over and converted into a beautiful hotel. And it was actually voted one of the top hotels in the UK. So it's famous for afternoon tea and it's absolutely wonderful. So take a look at the website, have a look at the hotel. And we're gonna be connecting with lots of chefs and we're gonna see, really see where food comes from in Ireland, take you to the rivers and uh, so that you can see the, the fishing and to, to see the, 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 the port. And uh, the, obviously with Ireland being an island, we have amazing seafood. And I know that a lot of people think, oh, Irish food, Irish people can't cook. And people have such a bad opinion of Irish food and they think of the stodgy, overcooked food that's bland with no flavor. And, and that's kind of what people say, you're an Irish cook, you know, what type of food do you cook? And, and I think for some reason the Irish food has got a really bad rap, but if you actually travel to Ireland, you will be outstanded by the quality of the food. Because once again, it's very natural. And you've, because you've got really good, uh, the, fr the waters are clean and pure, so the seafood is excellent. The beef, again, is natural. And all the vegetables, and you know yourself, it's all about uh, having the, the soil that it comes in, and that's gonna produce the flavor with your vegetables. Uh, just like a carrot, for example, you take a, a carrot and some of the carrots that you buy in the grocery store have no flavor, like the, the baby carrots are, they're just, the, you might as well just not bother as far as I'm concerned, but you take some of the, a, a carrot that is grown in Ireland with the soil is so rich and fertile, it's just bursting with flavor, something so simple, but you're gonna get to taste the amazing flavor, but also the fact that our chefs are really trained and that they're producing some of the most creative, outstanding food and people have said that some of the best meals I've ever had that came my tour that they were able to taste. So I invite you to come and taste the flavors of Ireland and uh, please keep in touch with me as well. I do a lot of events as well with my business and on my website you can keep in touch with me and also please like me on Facebook as well. And just thank you so much. It's always such a, a treat to come here to the Brebeckers and I always learn so much from Ashley and from Sue, because coming from Ireland, everything was more natural for me. The, the, as I say, things are, it's the, the country, the food is more farm to table anyway. So when I moved to America, I could see the over-processing and everything's done in such bulk. And when I first moved to America, I thought it was really cool. I thought, wow, this is awesome. You know, the grocery stores and everything, the, the overproduction was amazing. But, you know, as I uh, lived here, I started to, really miss the food and really miss the quality of those things, uh, going for the organic, going for the whole grain. And uh, then I started to kind of go back to my roots and the cookbook was really going back to the, my heritage, going back to my grandmother, the way she did things. And then I, I heard about the bread bakers uh, many years ago, probably about 10 years ago, but somehow I never really got connected. And then a friend connected me with Sue and I came over here and it was just amazing because it just kind of felt like all the values that I grew up in Ireland, that the Beckers were not only doing that, but were streets ahead, even of where we were at in Ireland. And just, I'm always learning about the benefits of flour and you know what's gonna be good for my health, for my body. And uh, that there is really so much with overproduction that is not, it is destroying, I think our health and I'm learning as well on how to convert so many of my recipes. And you'll find that the breads and uh, with the whole grains and with the flours are, are just amazing. And I think that the conversions are, are there. And I know how I'm using the, the white sugar and all of those, but Sue and Ashley have been able to convert, I think, practically every recipe to recommend a really healthy substitution. So just thank you. It's just a real treat and it's just, Lovely to meet all the, the mothers and daughters and grandmothers that are here celebrating and uh, celebrating their Southern heritage. And many of you may have Irish heritage as well. Uh, at, uh, there's such a wonderful melting pot in America. Uh, but the thing is about tea is that everybody can enjoy, enjoy that uh, from all our different, different backgrounds. So Ashley, you want to? 
cookie bread is not quite done yet. Mm -hmm. So um, we're gonna finish letting it bake. Um, did y'all enjoy mm -hmm. all of the food so far? Mm -hmm. um, I'm telling you, her book is filled with even more fantastic um, recipes and yummy food and, and all of that stuff. So um, it is definitely worth every penny. And like I said, Judith will be happy to sign it for you. Um, I think the only, so y'all just sit and enjoy and chit chat and talk mm -hmm. and we're going to um, turn off the ovens here in a minute so that I don't sweat to death. Um, and if you want to try on some of the hats, the girls yes. can come up and try yes. on any of the hats for fun. Um, That's what they're there for. I, I do have to tell a funny story <laughs> that Judith shared with me yesterday. Um, they, her and her husband and their boys um, go to Fellowship Bible Church. It's where they go over in Roswell, is it Roswell, Alpharetta mm -hmm. area. Um, and she said that she was walking through church and a, a lady stopped her and she's like, oh, oh, I recognize you. You're Judith with the shamrock and the peach. She had bought the cookbook here at the Breadbeckers. And she, and she was like, do you go to church here? She was so excited. I was like, you're a celebrity, Judith. Absolutely. Um, so anyway, uh, so, and she is a celebrity. And I, I told her from, the, from day one when I bought the cookbook, my kids love to sit on the sofa and just look at the pictures which I have to give her husband a fantastic mm -hmm. plug. He's the photographer that took all the pictures for her cookbook. Um, and, uh, but anyway, my kids sit there and they flip through and they fight over which recipe we're going to make next. <laughs> so um, we've got a, they've got a whole list of things that I'm supposed to try, that we're supposed to try. Um, so definitely pick up her cookbook, um, come talk to her. She's mm -hmm. so much fun to talk to and spend time with. Um, we'll definitely have to come up with another idea to have you back again. Um, doesn't she remind you of the little girl from Brave? <laughs> like as soon as I saw, when I saw that movie clip, I was like, oh my goodness, it's Judith, you know, with the curly red hair and everything. Um, that I told her, I said, I hope that doesn't offend you because she's Scottish, you know, and you're Irish, but, but she said that she's Scotch-Irish, so it's okay. Um, one thing, other, what was the other thing that I was going to tell them? I think that was it. Definitely pick up, um, I think we've, we got a couple of questions, but definitely pick up the class flyer. Um, before you leave, um, be on the lookout. I have something very, very exciting um, coming hopefully in October. Um, we're going to be uploading once a week. We're going to be uploading um, short 20 to 30 minute videos of a complete meal um, to give you, um, I stayed up late last night uh, brainstorming a little bit more, coming up with ideas. Um, but that, though, that series is going to be called Hurry Home and our um, Hurry There hurry here um, lifestyle that we're living in. I want to share some quick tips and some fun recipes that will f have your family hurrying home uh, to eat together. Um, so be on the lookout for that. I'm going to start filming those very soon and we'll be uploading those very soon as well. Um, we have a couple of questions. I know I saw your hand first. Yes, ma'am. Okay, what times do all the different teas happen? They have the 11 is at 11 o'clock in the morning, and afternoon tea is between 3 and 4 p.m., and then high tea is between 5 and 7 p.m. The cream tea, that's spontaneous. That could be any time in the morning or in the afternoon. The other thing that I wanted to tell you was the tea concentrate. When you're catering, when you're doing big crowds for a party, what I do is I make a stronger concentrate of the tea and have that already made, warmed and set aside. And then you can get your freshly boiled water and add that to the concentrate. When you're catering for large numbers, cause, because you can't just simply keep up with, unless you've got a large container for boiling water. But I, I always, that, that's kind of a handy tip for for, for making head, just make whatever tea, make it more potent, make your concentrate enough to to do about 10, you know, triple it, what you're doing which is according exactly, to your- Yes, yep. which is exactly what um, yeah, you what did. I do yes, at you home, do, yeah. is I will, because this is the one that I personally own. I own the small Adagio tea kettle, because mm -hmm. um, it's really just, I'm the only one that drinks hot tea. Mm -hmm. Did I turn myself off again? No. Um, but I do, uh, for a whole half gallon of iced herbal tea, I will still do a third of a cup of my loose tea in here and my boiling water, and then I'll strain that into my half gallon pitcher, fill it the rest of the way up with cold water, uh, you know, sweeten it and fill it the rest of the way with cold water to make my half gallon. Um, so absolutely do your concentrates in something like this, even if you're doing um, for a big crowd. Mm -hmm. So.
the, the health um, issues with the silicone pants. From everything we can read, they're, they're completely safe. The silicone pants are completely safe. Um, and because it's not a flimsy 100% silicone, it's a coating over a, a steel pan. Um, and they are safe up to like 500 degrees or something like that. And typically, you're baking everything at 350. Um, the USA pan, that, that line of pans, they are not dishwasher safe. They do not recommend they go in the dishwasher. Um, but you'll notice after one or two uses, nothing sticks to them, so there's you nothing hardly, to put in the dishwasher. You hardly need to wash them. I mean, that, that You can wipe them off almost. Um, in fact, you have to be really careful. The first time I ever made um, pizza on the pizza crust one, I was taking it out of this I was taking it out of the oven and my hot pad had kind of a hole. It was kind of threadbare in a spot. So it started burning my finger. So I turned really fast, like did this motion and the pizza went <laughs> off the pizza pan. Um, thankfully because of the hot pizza and the cold countertop, it stopped right about there. And I was like, oh, that would have been really bad. And you have to be very careful taking a pan of cookies out because they don't stick. And if you move, too fast, they will just slide right off all over the place. They're they're fantastic pans. The loaf pans are wonderful. The muffin pans are wonderful. Um, the cake pans. Um, the trick to the cake pans, I will go ahead and tell you, is let your cake cool for about that's, ten minutes, which is with traditional. Any cake. Yeah. any cake, you let it cool for ten minutes and then dump it. But if you let the muffin or the cake completely cool, it will stick back to it. And that's with any kind of cake pan. Um, so that's just that's the one little little trick. Um, to those, but they're they're fantastic. We use them all the time. So the more classes you watch and come to, you'll you'll see that we we use those pans all the time for everything. Do we have any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Any? We will always have a Christmas class. Yeah. Always, always, always. We will have a Thanksgiving class and we will have a Christmas class. Absolutely. Oh yes, it's going to be May six, Monday, May six. For okay, seven so days. The question was, what are the dates that she's going to Ireland for the tour? So it's basically, it's almost like the first and third week of May. The first. First through the third? No, no it, it's two, two different, different trips. Two and different they're, trips. They're going to be, each of the, I'm not doing any more than 20 people per trip between 15 and 20, so they're going to be small, intimate groups. So that's why I'm doing two tours, because I didn't want people to feel, you know, it was kind of going to be, you know, that wasn't personal, so that's why I kind of prefer the intimate groups. So. It's between 15 and 20 people, and the first one is going to be May 6th, the first week of May, and then the next one is, I believe it's like May, uh, whatever that, that third week is, that Monday. The dates are on my website, but it's going to be... And for all of you web users yeah. that watch this in the future, <laughs> this is May of 2013, so if you're watching this in 2015... Too bad you missed it. <laughs> Check out Judith's website for, for trips in. <laughs> and any of you mm. that know my husband, you can go ahead and tell him and remind him that my birthday is May 27th, and I could definitely use a trip to Ireland that third week of May. <laughs> mom needs and mom needs, him. yes, no, no, mom does not need to chaperone my birthday trip. But yes. So, any other Well, I'd love to bring you, you all. Like, yes. Yeah. We Um, the chicken it's salad. The, mm -hmm. what, what, what's different about that chicken salad recipe as opposed to what we have in, in the South, and she actually has both recipes in her cookbook, but I knew you guys would be used to Southern chicken salad, so we decided to do the coronation chicken salad. And it's that, that Indian influence that they have in Great Britain um, of the curry and the mango chutney, uh, which mango chutney, I did not know what mango chutney was. And I, um, it does have apricots um, and mango yes, dried, dried apricots that you soak overnight and then blend up. Um, and the mango chutney and the curry powder is what gives it that flavor. Whereas we're very used to the tarragon and the mayonnaise and the mustard and the apples and the grapes and the pecans and that southern twist to it. Um, but the coronation, the queen's coronation chicken salad is definitely that Indian influence with the mango chutney, um, which is a pick it's almost like a relish yes. a pickled it's mm -hmm. a pickled mango uh, relish and you can get it in the, the sweet and sour it's very yeah. it's that sweet and sour together um, and you can get it I got it at Publix um, in the international aisle um, but I kept looking over with all of the tea cookies in like the British section of the international aisle that is not where it is it's in the Indian section of the <laughs> international aisle 
um, with all of the other Indian spices and things like that is where you can find the, um, I think, Major Grey. Major Grey, Major yes. Grey is the, the brand British, that they yeah. have, is mm -hmm. the British brand of mango chutney, but that's what makes the chicken salad um, different. I will tell you, because um, most of our classes, we give you a handout with all of the recipes and things like that. Because Judith is our guest and this is her cookbook, we only gave you our, um, you know, our substitutions. You need to, you need to purchase her cookbook. It's a little different. You, want, you will want. You will. You will love it. it like I said, every recipe in there, um, though it's beautiful, um, and they are some delicate recipes. They are very, very family friendly. And the shepherd's pie is the best you've ever tasted. You die for. Usually best shepherd's, shepherd's pie. pie is kind of bland. Oh my goodness, that one. In fact, my daughter's a dancer, and so she dances every night of the week and comes in late and so I dip her dinner whatever I've made in a bowl and she comes in and heats it up and has it you know so um, she was uh, she had come home the first time I made it late and I had already gone like in the back but I came home I heard her she's sitting on the sofa and she's like what is this and I said well do you like it and she goes uh, yeah I think I'd call it heaven in a bowl <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought Aww. I'd tell you that. And my husband, who's never been a fan of shepherd's pie, loves um, oh. Judith's shepherd's pie. Absolutely. And the first time I made it for my family, my kids are nine, six, and five. So they're still young. And I, you make it in a nine by 13 glass casserole dish. And my husband comes walking and he goes, we're going to be eating on this for weeks. Why did you make so much? <laughs> yeah. When we got done to do dishes, we had eaten over half of it in one <laughs> night, in one sitting, and it was gone for lunch the next day. The boys were like, I want more of that, of Miss Judith's pie. That's what they called it, Miss Judith's pie. So um, you, will, you will absolutely love everything I did want to put in a plug for the cooking classes coming up. Um, the fall baking class, I am so excited to do. Um, be doing that on a Wednesday, I believe, October 17th, I believe it is. And um, we're doing roasted vegetables, and uh, mm. this, oh man, and then we're doing a roasted barley and beef and mushroom soup with the roasted vegetables. Mm. Then I'm doing a sesame loaf that is so cool. That's in the Ancient Grains mm. cookbook that you actually let it rise in a pot of water, and it rises up to the top. It is so mm. delicious. Then, of course, we're doing some uh, pumpkin custard. and uh, You can't have a fall class without mom without pumpkin somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. Yes. But I'm really, really getting excited, and we're going to do a cultured butter for you to eat on the bread. And um, So that's coming up in October. We've got a getting started class. If you know anybody that's ready to get started, that's on Saturday, September 29th. Pressure cooking class, October 13th, which if you really should bring your husband. That's just an eating experience. I mean, we do white and thin rice. We Mark your calendars. I know we have Lars Liebisch, the German chef. And how many of y'all have seen Lars Liebisch? Oh my gosh, so cute. You think her voice um, turns you <laughs> excited, but Lars is. Yeah, anyway. Um, I don't know why I said that, but um, <laughs> I'm getting like real embarrassed now. Um, Lars is just fabulous. You can cut this out of the video. <laughs> if you ever watch it, I'll be real embarrassed. Um, but anyway, Lars. <laughs> Lars is um, Pittler's representative, and um, he's just great. He's going to do a couple of classes. We haven't totally settled on everything he's going to do, maybe a pressure cooking and maybe a knife skills class. We, we aren't sure. I know y'all are like, wow. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> you are all on your own on that <laughs> yeah, one. Mom. Like, anyway, I really love Judith, and like Ashley said, she made garage sound just really amazing. And um, when I met Judith, I actually Sharon, I think, introduced us the first time. Yeah. And uh, she came, and I fell in love with her, and I, I just said, yes, I want to carry your book, and we prayed in the parking lot. You would have thought we had known each other forever, and uh, I hope she never gets tired of hearing me tell the story. And I went home, and I started reading the book, and I fell in love with the book and what I told her I said what the Lord has done with you in this book is I think turns your heart towards home and family mm -hmm. it kind of makes you just fall in love with your heritage and your background no matter what you know our backgrounds aren't necessarily always lovely but you still got something from them and it's still your heritage no matter what and um, that's just what I saw with Sharon's book, and I fell in love with it. And then I mean it was Judith's like, book. I mean, Judith's book. Mm -hmm. Why did I say Sharon? Um, <laughs> and, and it was like, after we already started carrying it, I started flipping through the recipes. I was like, ooh, she's got, this is white flour, white sugar. What am I going to do here? But um, <laughs> we just went, you know what? We'll just tell you that um, you can make all those easy substitutions. And Judith's so sweet when I, the first few things that I made of hers that, that I substituted, she just kind of oohed and awed, and she said, now this is like my grandmother's, you know. And um, the sticky was, toffee puddings, remember? Yes, the yeah. sticky oh. toffee puddings. She was like, oh, these are like my grandmother's. Have if you haven't done the sticky toffee puddings, they are delightful with the dates, and you puree the dates, and oh, man, they're mm -hmm. just delicious. So anyway, but that's what I know coming up, and I think they're ready to serve mm. the tea bread. The yes. smells amazing. It's nice and warm. Oh. It's nice and warm. So I'm going to let it cool for just a few minutes. Does anybody have any other questions? Mm -hmm for us before we say goodbye to the internet now that we've totally <laughs> let mom embarrass herself <laughs> um, thank y'all so much for coming um, we're technically an hour earlier than we advertised and that's so that you guys have plenty of time to spend with each other especially if dad's at home with the rest of the kids or whatever he doesn't know that we got out early and y'all could have an hour left to spend <laughs> together right um, and then, of course, Judith and I are here if you have any questions or if you want your picture taken with Judith. I know that she's fine with that. Um, and, of course, to get her to sign your book for you. So thank you all so much for coming. I'm gonna, we're going to get this sliced, and then we'll bring you a sample of the tea bread. All right? Have a great rest of the day.